while black studies was truly revolutionary in reimagining a field, it did not, in my view and in the view of many, really understand the importance of gender. And so much of black studies in its early days was really the study of black men. It was the study of black history, not black history and her story. And so I began fairly early on to say, but where are the women folk here? Where are the issues that really are at the center of the lives and the dreams of black women when so much of this is centered in men? I kind of am who I am. And if there's two things that I can't change, and even if I could, I probably wouldn't. One is being a woman and the second is being black. Those two things I kind of like, I think they're pretty cool. I'm an African-American woman. When I get up every morning and look in the mirror, I see an African-American woman. And that's very much my heritage and very much who I am. So I can't say it's harder or easier being one or the other because I am both and I always will be both. I never would have thought that I would have heard myself say that there's more of an issue with being a woman than there is an issue being black. As a black woman, I never would have thought I would have heard myself say that. Los Angeles SNCC fell apart because of the gender battles uh, uh, and the battles over politics as well. But the gender battle was uh, very central. And I say it was a battle around gender. It wasn't a battle between the genders. Uh, the catalyst for this battle happened when someone involved at the national level came out to visit the chapter and did not like the fact that there were women in leadership. Black feminism is a lens. It's a framework for understanding the world, including African-American experience. It's a battle that we continue to wage. There are loads of folk who think that black feminism is irrelevant. And when you think of the black woman, all the change that they are available, she has on her legs, economic, political, social, you name it. And until we release all of these chains off of her legs, we will not have the freedom for any of us that we think we're entitled to. Toughest part of my first year in the NBA was just all the scrutiny. I really personally felt like people were expecting me to fail. They just knew it was gonna happen. They just knew that I wouldn't make it, that I, I didn't have the intestinal fortitude, I was a woman, I was too soft, I, um, I wasn't quick enough, I couldn't keep up. And I said, all the naysayers, I will silence you with my ability to just do my job. And I came to work one day and there was a, a little note at my little workspace, someone had left for me helpfully that said, nigger go home. And when I saw that note, I remember thinking to myself, okay, wonder who this is for? Because I'd been raised in a way that nobody would have called me that name, so this couldn't be for me. And it's interesting to me thinking back on it that that was my first response because that told you a lot about who I was. But my second response was, oh, this must be for me. But what will, I'm not gonna go in a corner and cry. I'm not gonna go and angrily complain. So I kind of innocently walked to my boss and said, look what I found. Uh, for six years of my life, I didn't speak, except to my brother. And uh, my grandmother would braid my hair the way old black ladies still braid girls' hair. I would sit on the floor on a pillow. Mama would sit on a chair, on a chair She'd pull her dress way down between her legs and so I could get very close to her, my back to her, so both of us looking out. And my hair was huge and very, very thick and, and uh, it challenged anybody. And my grandmother would brush my hair. She'd say, sister, mama don't care what these people say, but you must be an idiot or stupid or a moron because you can't talk. Sister, mama know when you and the good Lord get ready, you're gonna be a teacher. Sister, you're gonna teach all over the world. 